We begin today's show in Oklahoma, where the state's Pardon and Parole Board has denied clemency for death row prisoner Richard Glossop, even though Oklahoma's own attorney general has sought to vacate Glossop's conviction. On Wednesday, Oklahoma's Republican attorney general, Gettner Drummond, took the unusual step of joining Glossop's defense team in arguing for clemency. But the Pardon and Parole Board voted two to two to deny clemency despite widespread doubt over Glossop's guilt. An execution date has now been set for May 18th. This is part of what Oklahoma's attorney general told the parole board. I want to acknowledge how unusual it is for the state to support a clemency application of a death row inmate. I'm not aware of any time in our history that an attorney general has appeared before this board and argued for clemency. I'm also not aware of any time in the history of Oklahoma when justice would require it. Ultimately, that is why we are here, everyone in this room. We are here to see that justice is done. We may have different opinions on what justice looks like in this case, and I fully respect those differences. But in the end, that's what we must have. For me, as the state's chief law enforcement officer, I must be primarily considering what justice is for the state of Oklahoma. And that is what has compelled me to devote hours, countless hours, of my time examining the facts in this case. And it is that sense of justice that has compelled me to release materials to the defense team that have been long withheld. I was concerned enough by the research that I had observed that I should retain an independent counsel to conduct a comprehensive review. That was Oklahoma's Attorney General, Gettner Drummond, urging the Oklahoma Parole Board to grant clemency to Richard Glossop, who has always maintained his innocence. His case dates back to 1997, when Glossop was working as a manager at the Best Budget Inn in Oklahoma City, when his boss, Barry Van Trees, was murdered. A maintenance worker, Justin Sneed, admitted he beat Van Trees to death with a baseball bat, but claimed Glossop offered him money for the killing. The case rested almost solely on Sneed's claims. No physical evidence ever tied Glossop to the crime. And Sneed, in exchange for his testimony, did not get the death penalty. We go now to Oklahoma City, where we're joined by the award-winning investigative reporter Liliana Segura. She's a senior reporter for The Intercept. She's closely covered Richard Glossop's case since 2015. Liliana, welcome back to Democracy Now! Explain how unusual what happened yesterday was, and go more deeply into the Glossop case. Well, thank you so much for having me, Amy. And and you know your your introduction did a really good job laying out uh, some of the basics about this case. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I am still trying to process what happened yesterday because it was so unusual. Um, not only unusual, but completely unexpected. Uh, three weeks ago. Those of us following the case, those of us, uh, those those people involved in this case, truly did not expect that this uh, clemency hearing would go forward. Uh, Gentner Drummond, as he said, uh, had taken the very unusual step of of uh, filing a motion before the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals, asking the court to vacate uh, Glossop's conviction and send it back to Oklahoma City for a new trial. Uh, that uh, the Oklahoma City DA uh, had made very clear that this was a case that was probably not going to be uh, retried and that and and uh, Richard Glossop was really uh, in a position where he was able to imagine a possible eventual release uh, life outside of uh, prison walls uh, and almost as quickly as that uh, happened you know things just sort of changed uh, all of a sudden uh, the, the the court unexpectedly uh, rejected the attorney general's motion uh, and and then uh, rather than intervene uh, to to stop the clemency hearing from going forward uh, as governor Stitt has done before uh, uh, the clemency a hearing did take place. And on Wednesday, yesterday morning, uh, I attended a packed hearing where Gentner Drummond, along with Rex Duncan, the, the former prosecutor who undertook a, an independent investigation into this case, both spoke about why they believe that this execution should not go forward. Uh, Rex Duncan said, 
this is uh, you know, a first for me. I, I'm not usually here to agree with the defense. Uh, and so when uh, the board members came back at the very end uh, with this two to two vote, uh, which effectively denies clemency, everyone was shocked. It was a really stunning moment. And I think a lot of us are still waking up this morning trying to grasp what really happened. Well, Liliana, could you talk about some of the details that have emerged through the years of uh, destroyed evidence by the state, misstatements by key witnesses, what the, the basis of even the recommendation by the attorney general uh, uh, to, to, uh, for clemency? Can you talk about, uh, can you talk about uh, the specifics? Absolutely. And let me just say, uh, because it, there's no way to cover it all, this is really a case that's taken a tremendous uh, number of twists and turns. Uh, if, you're, if your uh, viewers and listeners want to go deep into this case, I would urge them to look at the coverage that my colleague Jordan Smith and I have produced going back to 2015. It's all in one place at The Intercept. Uh, I would also urge them to watch the 2017 four-part documentary by Joe Berlinger called Killing Richard Glossip uh, that also goes into these, these questions. And in fact, uh, it's part of the reason, a large part of the reason, that documentary series that a, a number of very prominent right-wing lawmakers here in Oklahoma have have uh, uh, taken on this case uh, as, a, as a campaign uh, for them. But to answer your question more directly, you know, from the beginning, this case, uh, the evidence in this case was weak. As you highlighted, you know, this this story of Richard Glossop being the mastermind behind this murder came solely from Justin Sneed. Uh, there were two trials. The first trial and uh, the first conviction in 1998 was actually overturned in 2001 uh, on the grounds that Glossop received ineffective assistance of counsel. One of the critical mistakes that Glossop's attorneys made was their failure to show the jury a really astonishing uh, uh, videotape, which showed how two Oklahoma City police detectives had interrogated Justin Sneed um, and, and, in fact, named Glossop something like six times before Justin Sneed ever claimed that Glossop had uh, put him up to this, uh, the detectives were telling Sneed, uh, you know, we know there's more to this. He's he's setting you up. They named Richard Glossop. And Sneed, eventually, you see in this tape, goes along uh, and, and and helps create this narrative that, that has defined this case ever, ever since. And so that was all known. That's been known uh, for, for years and years. Uh, Richard Glossop came very close in 2015 to being executed. Um, and at that time, witnesses had come forward to say, wait a minute, Justin Sneed was portrayed as this hapless, clueless, kind of follower who did anything that Richard Glossop would say, that couldn't have been further from the truth. You know, people that knew him and, and had met him in jail said that that Sneed admitted, boasted even, that that, that he was had gotten away with something that, that Glossop was facing the death penalty for. So so there's a lot that has been known, but 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 in terms of the the newest revelations, uh, this has come out largely over the course of the past year. Um, in in uh, some years back, uh, these right wing lawmakers, uh, or a bipartisan group, but but largely spearheaded by conservative lawmakers in Oklahoma, uh, uh, have uh, were urging for for the governor, for the parole board, to take a closer look at Glossop's case. And when that those efforts uh, failed, they they sought a, a law firm that would undertake an independent investigation. And this this was um, done by a law firm named uh, Reed Smith. Took on the case pro bono, uh, devoted countless hours, uh, interviewed some 40 witnesses, dozens of people who were never interviewed by the police, uh, 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 looked at all of the records and, and indeed received stuff that had never been uh, turned over before. And some of the more, some of the most explosive revelations uh, in, in the Reed Smith report, which came out last year, uh, was that, for example, uh, Justin Sneed had actually sought to recant his testimony between the first and the second trial. There are uh, letters to his uh, attorney asking, uh, you know, how he can how he can uh, undo this deal that he made. Uh, you know, sort of expressing. Uh, 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 
a sense of regret uh, almost. And, and this was also sort of known, you know, back years back, Justin Sneed's own daughter had come forward saying that her her father uh, was was regretting uh, the fact that he had had uh, sent helped send Richard Glassop to death row. So these letters from Sneed, that's one piece, uh, significant piece of evidence. There's also a lot of evidence that it turns out was destroyed between the first and the second trial. Um, this included financial records that were critical because uh, these records would have undercut the state's theory of this crime, which was that Glossip wanted to get rid of Barry Van Treese so that he could take over the motel, um, which was really uh, these financial records, those that were not destroyed, um, the ones that we have since seen, uh, really go a long way in, in debunking that theory. Uh, so, so this evidence that was destroyed, uh, one of the prosecutors at the second trial um, who assisted the lead prosecutor uh, has since said over and over again that this is horrifying to them, uh, to him, that, that this should never have happened. This shouldn't happen in death penalty Liliana, cases. Liliana, we want to turn to Richard Glossop in his own words, speaking remotely at his clemency hearing on Wednesday. First, I want the Van Trees family to know how terrible I feel for what they have gone through. What your family has gone through, no family should ever have to endure. I must say again for this hearing that I did not know about Justin Sneed's plan to commit any crime against Barry Van Trees, and I would have never thought of paying anybody to commit a crime. I absolutely did not cause Justin Sneed to commit any crime against Mr. Van Trees, let alone to murder him. I know that in the chaos of Mr. Van Trees' death, I made mistakes in how I responded. I'm deeply sorry that in my fear and confusion, I caused anyone any further harm. Today, I want to thank many people who have taken the time to look at this case closely and to take a stand about it. So that's Richard Glossop speaking at his clemency hearing. As we begin to wrap up, Liliana, um, can you tell us what this pardon and parole board is? It, the two to two vote, how does a divided vote lead to his death? And what uh, about the governor's stance, uh, Governor yeah. Stitt? Yes. T t to be honest, that's a question that all of us are asking ourselves and trying to understand. One of the next steps uh, that uh, that Glossop's lawyer, Don Knight, is, is taking is to challenge that very uh, setup. Um, it's critical to understand that this is a five-member board. One of the board members, Richard Smotherman, recused himself because his wife, Connie Smotherman, prosecuted Glossop and sent him to death row. So that recusal was absolutely appropriate. What makes absolutely no sense is that the resulting vote uh, still requires—this is four people voting—it still requires a three uh, three votes in favor of clemency. And so a two-to-two -two tie, as it turns out, uh, is is weighted in favor of the no's. Uh, and, and so that that needs—that is being challenged. Um, uh, as far as the board's makeup, you know, this is a five-member board. Three of the board members are appointed by Stitt, two of the other are appointed by two different courts, including the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals that has repeatedly refused to consider the evidence of, of Glossop's innocence. Uh, so all of these boards are, are political, um, but, but again, we were not expecting this outcome at all. Uh, this is a, a severe blow, and it was a really astonishing moment um, after this three-hour hearing uh, to, to hear it uh, result in that way. Yep. And Liliana, I wanted to ask you, what was the uh, uh, the victim's family also spoke at the board meeting? Could you talk about what they said as well? Absolutely. So, you know, like I mentioned, Richard Glossop had faced execution. Well, this is his ninth execution date, but he had come extremely close in 2015. Uh, uh, prior to that, uh, there was an uh, there was a clemency hearing in 2014 where the widow of Barry, uh, Barry Van Trees, uh, Donna Van Trees, spoke about the impact of her husband's murder. You know, they had several young children. Uh, she she said what victims' family members often said that this was, uh, uh, you know, a loss that was indescribable. That uh, severely impacted her family and continues to. So she 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 repeated um, a lot of what she shared, as did other uh, family members. But they also uh, described a, a deep sense of betrayal at this idea that the state, rather than arguing as it 
basically always does in favor of this execution that that the top law enforcement officer in the state was actually saying that he he didn't want to see this execution proceed uh, and 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 that was you know uh, in some ways understandable but as your as your clip that you played early on uh, demonstrates the job of the attorney general isn't to to satisfy the 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 uh, the wishes and emotions of the victim's family. It's to do justice, uh, and, and, and you know, for the for the people of Oklahoma, and that includes Richard Glossop and his loved ones. And so um, that was a really difficult thing to listen to um, because. Uh, well, in that moment, uh, you know, we all empathize with the pain of, of the victim's family, but but. I personally was feeling like we were going to hear a vote in favor of clemency. And so, again, it's just uh, it's really disorienting to find ourselves here. Finally, Liliana, uh, the state of Oklahoma is going to is pushing through some what something like two dozen executions in the next two years, um, this one being uh, one of them. Well, in fact, yeah, th that had been the, the plan under Gentner Drummond's predecessor. Uh, uh, very tellingly, Gentner Drummond, who came into office in January, one of his first moves uh, was uh, not only to launch this independent probe into Richard Glossop's case, but also to slow down this frenzied execution schedule. Uh, and and so th that they, there are still a lot of people in line to be executed um, after Richard Glossop uh, over the next couple of years. Uh, but but he explicitly uh, said, after attending the first execution of the year in January, that this this uh, schedule was untenable, uh, that it was um, taking a toll on the employees of the Department of Correction who are tasked with carrying out these executions, and that he he wanted to to slow down those executions. So the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals grudgingly uh, allowed this change in schedule. Uh, but but yes, Oklahoma continues to execute people, um, and there I should also say that there are a lot of problems with the cases um, that, that will follow uh, Richard Glossop's execution We just date. have 10 seconds. Uh, does Richard Glossop's case go to the Supreme Court? Yes, uh, that it, absolutely. It will be um, before the court to review. Liliana Segura, senior reporter for The Intercept, has covered Richard Glossop's case since 2015. You can go to Intercept's website to see all of the coverage. She was speaking to us from Oklahoma City.